very, very basic. What I'd like to do is today is uh, spend a minute reviewing what we've done so far yesterday and then build upon it. And I'd also like to spend some time talking about your next assignment that, that requires a GUI. So let me download, when we finish booting here, let me download the example from last time. We'll take a few minutes reviewing that, sort out any questions that you have, and then we'll look at the next example. Or, alternatively, I would say we can look at that nice piece of scenery for the next 50 minutes while the computer decides whether it wants to boot or not. But we'll look at the two examples because they do things slightly different ways and they really illustrate sort of the three ways that you can handle the one situation, namely how you can create an action listener. All right, here we had our very first example. We simply did a simple conversion between Fahrenheit and centigrade. You put in the centigrade, click the button, you get the answer. You put something that's not numeric in there and you get an exception. What we do is we import these things. Some of the components that we have are swing, components, that's a, a way of doing Java user interfaces. AWT is another way. We have our first GUI which extends a JFrame. Again, you can think of the window as being a frame because we can put different panels inside that frame. And it implements the interface Action Listener. Action Listener is a interface and everything that we're going to interact with that is that the user can, can click or, or interact in a different way. If we want some code to run when they do that, 
we assign an action listener. So in this case, we don't assign an action listener to the text box because we don't have any code that runs immediately when they interact with the text box. We have code that runs when they click the button. So that's why the only thing that has an action listener is the button. So we have our frame. We make it visible. We say, hey, when you close the frame, exit the program. We create a panel. We're going to skip the action listener for now. We add our label, text box, button, and so on to the panel. We set the main pane of this frame to be the panel. We set the size, and then they're good to go. So I'm assuming everything is straightforward other than the add action listener, because that's where we get into the code that interacts between the user interface and the Java code. I can say add action listener this because this, cla this class, this object, first GUI, implements action listener. I have to supply this method an action listener. All right? Again, remember I defined interface. When we talked about interfaces a while back, I says a way to define an interface it is a class can serve the role of this. Uh, it can be treated as this. A bird can be treated as a flying thing. A bird can serve in the role of a flyer, a thing that flies. Well, this object can serve in the role of a action listener. The reason it can serve in the role of that is because we have implemented the method action performed. Because that's the only method that exists in that action listener interface. So if we say it serves the role of that, and we have that method, then this class can be the class that handles when the button is clicked. So that's what we do. We define the button and set the action listener to this, which means when that button is clicked, this code runs. And this code is fairly straightforward. It simply grabs the value from the text box, does the math, and then puts the answer back in the other label. If there's an exception, just about the only conceivable reason that there would be an exception would be if this value is not numeric. Because remember, a text box, you can enter any text in. So if I put something that's not numeric, it will throw an exception, and I display invalid input. So if I get rid of implements action listener, What's going to happen when I try to compile it? It'll fail. Why will it fail? It'll fail specifically on this line. Because I can only put as an argument to this function something that implements the action listener. And if we get rid of that implements action listener, then this no longer implements the action listener. This is this object itself, this very object that we're dealing with. Okay, So it would be the, the J frame that we put up on the screen. That object, which corresponds to the frame that displays on the screen, also has the code to process when the button is clicked. Now, the other thing that we could have a problem is if we say it implements that interface, but doesn't have the onClick method. We're also going to get an error because when we said that this implements action listener, that's a promise. And our promise is that this object will contain an onClick method. All right? And if we get rid of that onClick method, then we lied. And the compiler doesn't like being lied to. Any questions about this? This is a key case of where we actually have uh, a pretty, uh, well, how do I want to say this? A pretty blatant case of how interfaces are useful.
I can make any object I want to be in a position to handle the clicking as long as it implements the action listener and as long as it has an on click method. Now, this guy only has one button on it, so that's pretty straightforward. In our second example, we actually had two buttons. So let's look at this one and let's play a little around a little bit with the layout. All right. First, we're going to look at the listeners, then we're going to look at the layout. In this case, we have two buttons. All right. Each one of them, we want something to happen when the user presses it. So we, we're going to need an action listener for each of them. Now, it is possible to have one action listener for multiple buttons, in which case the action listener has to look at and see which button got pressed in order to figure out how to process it. All right? So we have to look to see which button got pressed. So we could get by with only one action listener if we wanted to. And sometimes that's a good idea. For example, I'm going to have my Android class, hint, hint, for two of you, all right, in here, do a memory game application where you turn a certain number of cards upside down. And when you click on them, it shows, it shows their face. It turns them right side up. And you can see them. And if they're a match, you get to keep the cards. If they're not a match, they flip back over. So you have to remember and, and find all the cards like that. Well, if we had a 24 by 24, or not a 24 by 24, if we had a 6 by 4 grid of cards, where there's 24 cards, it would kind of be bogus to have 24 action listeners that pretty much did the same thing. All right? Because every time we click on a card, we flip it over. All right? Well, it would be kind of bogus to have 24 of those that says flip card one over. Second one said flip card two over. So we could write one action listener for all of them. So when we clicked on it, boom. We, we do, do the same thing. But for something like this, where there's just a, a limited number of buttons, there's two buttons, each button has its own different functionality. The functionality to convert centigrade to Fahrenheit is different than the functionality of converting centigrade to Fahrenheit. So I went with two listeners. Okay? I could have done this with one, but I went with two. And I define them in two different ways. Hey. <laughs> I define them in two different ways just to demonstrate. If I was doing this for real, I would pick one way and do both of them that way. Because it's just kind of a little goofy to, to, to be inconsistent, right? But I deliberately was inconsistent because I wanted to show the two different methods. In one of the methods, I said that the action listener is new C to F object. And C to F object is defined in a class C to F, which also implements action listener. Remember, whoever we're going to put in the role of action listener better implement the action listener. Otherwise, we're going to get a compile error. So I can use C to F as an action listener because it implements the action listener interface. And it has, I, I was saying it has the on click method. I meant the action perform method. All right. So if it didn't implement the action listener, would get an error. If it implemented the action listener and it didn't have an action perform method, 
it would also have an error. It could have additional methods if we wanted to. <coughs> Let's say instead of doing a Fahrenheit to centigrade calculation, we were doing a calculation that was more complicated. Something, you know, that, in, that required uh, sines and cosines and compound interest and all kinds of crazy stuff. If we did that, then we could have more functions in here. But when we implement that interface, we have to at least have the functions that are defined in the interface. In this case, it's action performed. So that's one way I can do it. This is called an inner class. It's called an inner class because it's defined inside the main class. The main class goes from the beginning of the file all the way to the end. And this is defined inside of it. Now, when you have an inner class, one nice thing is that we can refer to parts of the main class. All right? So for example, txt temp is a property of the main class, right? The parent class. So I can refer to that, txt temp, inside the inner class because the inner class is part of the bigger class. So I can refer to any of those attributes. All right? And if I click on that button, sure enough, I do the calculation of centigrade to Fahrenheit. The other listener, I use what's called an anonymous inner class. This is not an anonymous class because it has a name. This is an anonymous class because I don't have any name for the class. I just say it's an action listener. It implements the action listener interface. And here is the function defined right smack dab in the middle of the code that handles the action performed and does the calculation of Fahrenheit to centigrade. So different ways to set the action listener. All right. We've seen three of them. Either the frame itself can be the action listener, we can create an inner class, or we can create an anonymous inner class. Now, one thing I want to look at for this is I played a little bit around, uh, I played around a little bit with um, the layout in this example. One thing I show here is this is sort of a shortcut. If you want to break that down into two lines, you could do this. Create my event handler and then add that event handler to the listener or add the listener to the button. This does all that in one step. Now, notice how the layout of this is. I have some code commented out, but I set the layout of this panel as being the box layout. A box layout, in the box layout, each control that I put in it, think of it as being a little box. And I set the layout of my panel as being a box layout along the Y axis. Remember, the Y axis goes up and down. The X axis goes across. So in this case, stuff are going to be stacked on top of each other. So I add the label for the temperature on top. I add the label for, or the text box for the temperature underneath it. I then put panel 2 underneath that. And then finally I put the label for result. 
So this is a label for the tamp. I'll put LT. This is a text box for the tamp. This is the panel. And this is the results, the label for the results. Panel 2, I created up here. And I just added the two buttons. So panel 2, by default, it's going to have a box layout that's oriented horizontally. So I put those two buttons in that panel, and then I put that panel right here in the bigger panel. And then finally, I set the panel uh, as the content pane. In other words, that's what the frame contains, and I'm good to go. I have my two listeners, and that's why when I click the button, a different thing happens, a different calculation is performed. Questions about this? Well, by default, the panels are, if I don't set the layout of a panel, it's going to be oriented horizontally. So let's think for a minute. Here's what I want. Let's, let's alter this a little bit. I'm going to draw what I want. I want the window to look like this. I want to have the label for temperature and the text box next to each other. Then I want to have the two buttons and then I want to have the results. So in other words, instead of like this, where the label for the temperature and the text box are on top of each other, I want them to be next to each other horizontally. But then I want that stacked on top of the buttons and on top of the results. How would I make that change? To have the label and the text box next to each other. I'd make its own panel. So I could, for example, instead of having P add label temp, P add text temp, I'm going to create a brand new panel. And I'll call it Jan uh, panel 1. And I'm going to change P to P main. just so that I know that that's the main panel. All right. So I'm going to want to put the text box, the label in the text box in panel 1. I'm going to want to put the two buttons in panel 2, which I'm doing. <coughs> and then I want the results label underneath. So. I can add to panel 1 the label and the text for temp. Panel 2 has the two buttons. I can then set panel main layout to be vertical. I can add panel 1 and panel 2 to panel main. And then I can add the panel main, the results label. So you can kind of use panels inside of panels to get sort of a grid-like feel to it. All right? As you put things in, you can uh, have a panel, the main panel stacked vertically. Then each row of that panel can be a little panel that's stacked horizontally. So let's look to see what this looks like. 
and I can run it, and the panel and text box are right next to each other. The text box is a little bit small, though. All right. Remember how we corrected that before? Well, when we create the text box, we give the text box a size. So I can say something like five. And now we can enter the temperature in. And click that. I would not obsess about getting a beautiful layout with this. Uh, we're coding this by hand. Coding elegant UIs by hand like this is going to be very difficult, and so I wouldn't worry about it right now. All right, just make sure that it's functional and that it's clear. It doesn't have to be beautiful, though. All right, another thing that we can do with the layout we can find in this code here. And I'm going to switch what's commented out. And we're going to change all these to be pmain, because I changed the name of that variable. we create what's called a border layout. Let's look for a picture of border layout. All right, I actually use the old style. But the border, with the border layout, the screen is divided into, or the panel, I should say, is divided into five sections, like this. The north was the old way of specifying it. Page start is the new way. This would be the west or line start. This would be the center or center. This would be the east or line end. And this would be south or page end. I believe you can use both of the names. So notice here I'm putting a layout. I'm putting label temp in the north. The center is text temp. The east is panel 2, that is the two buttons, and then the south is the results. So if I compile this, And our temperatures in the north. Since there's nothing over there, it's sort of smushed over. The temperature is here. My two buttons are here. 
and I get the answer down there. If you don't like the old syntax of north, south, east, and west, you can use the new syntax. So north would be page start. Center would be center. This would be line and, and this would be page and. No. Well, I mean, there's probably a way that you can orient stuff inside it, but um, that's the only directions. That, that there are. you can see the result are the same. Now keep in mind that you can mix and match this all over the place, right? In other words, I could create, in fact, I did do that. In the east section, I have my, nor, I have my grid like this. In this, the east or line end, I actually put a panel that was stacked horizontally. So you could mix and match. You could put inside one of these box layouts a panel that itself had a box layout or that had a, uh, a layout that was uh, a box layout or a, what is this called, a border layout. So I could put in each one of these a panel that had its own layout. So by doing this, we could get a very complicated, very involved uh, user interface simply by mixing and matching that stuff. Now, I don't want you to obsess about the UI. All right? As long as it is readable and functional, it should be good enough. I don't, I don't need it to look really good. I think it's not worth our time at this point to worry about beautiful looking Java interfaces. All right, let's look at our, let's look at another example. I think these are the ones we just saw. 
Okay, this looks like a good example. Okay, I created a dice class. And that dice class has the following properties and methods. It has a private integer is the face value. So this is assuming six side dice. Sorry if there's any Dungeons and Dragons people in here, but just a regular conventional six side dice. I have a method to roll the dice. And the roll of the dice randomly assigns the dice a value one through six. All right. Math random gives a number zero to 5.99999. I add 1 to it. That gives me a number of 1 to 6.99999. And then I truncate out any decimals, so that gives me a number from 1 to 6. Get gives me the value of the dice without rolling it. Roll rolls the dice and then gives me the value. Now I want to make sure this is a fair dice, right? So I have a test class for it. And what the test class does is it rolls the dice 10,000 times, all right? Now, this is where you have to use a little bit of judgment, right? If I rolled it, let's say, let's make it an even number. If I rolled it 6,000 times, According to probability, the expected value, which is a probability term, would be 1,000 for each. 1,000 once, 1,000 twos, 1,000 threes, 1,000 fours, 1,000 five, 1,000 six. But you know that it's not going to be exactly that. You know, If you roll the dice 6,000 times, you might get 990 ones and 1,005 twos and so on. But it should be around 1,000 each. If I roll the dice 6,000 times and I find that I have 3,000 ones and then a couple hundred of the other ones, I know that I did something wrong in my code, that it's not a fair dice. So I have this dice test that's going to count how many ones, twos, threes, fours, fives, and sixes we have. And it's going to do that by rolling the dice 6,000 times and count the number of each occurs. A switch is simply a different way to do like a series of if statements. Instead of having if value equals 1, if value equals 2, if value equals 3, this is a way I can just say, hey, look at the value. If it's 1, do this. If it's 2, do this, and so on. When I'm all done with the loop, I simply print out the six values. So let's roll this dice 6,000 times, and let's see if this is a fair dice or not. 
I changed it to be, it originally was set up to be 10,000. I changed it to be 6,000 because I figured the math would be easier. All right. We have 1,054 on the high end, 954 on the low end. It's probably just random fluctuations. We'll do this a few times. And again, it's all around 1,000. And of course, the uh, 1,000 of course, the bigger number that we get, the more to the ideal that would, would come to. So in other words, if I roll these six times, I'm not necessarily going to get one of each. I may get three of one, and that seems way out of, out of, uh, uh, out of normal. But that's only because I've just run a small number. If I run these 60,000 times, You see, again, we're getting very close to that. And the higher that I go, the closer to an even split it should be. Nice thing is, is this runs very quickly. Try six million rolls of the dice. All right. If you notice that if we just look at these numbers, we're getting very close to being an ideal uh, distribution of these numbers. OK, so I'm pretty happy my dice is fair. That's a good unit test for this, right? Not running the dice three times and saying, oh, yeah, I gave me a different number each time. It must be right, right? Run it a bunch of times and see, does that look like a reasonable distribution? Especially when you're dealing with something that deals with probability, right? Because if you're doing a tuition calculation, you could identify all the possibilities that it could be and test it, and you can check and verify you have an exact answer. If you're dealing with something that deals with probability, well, you don't know if it's just a fluke or what unless you do a large number of tests. So I'm happy that this works. So I'm confident that my dice object works. So now I'm going to incorporate my dice object into a GUI for an application. And that application is a game that I use in a lot of classes just to do simple stuff that's called the high-low game. All right? And I have a high-low game test. And what this does is this tests one round of the game. How does a high-low game work? You roll two dice, and you predict whether the, the value is going to be high, low, or seven. All right? So if I predict high, and it's eight through 12, I win. If I predict low, and the value of the dice is two through six, I win. If I pick 7 and it's 7, then I win. The payoffs are 1 to 1 for high and low and 4 to 1 for 7. Now, if you do the math on this, you're getting ripped off, all right, as with all gambling games, right? Because the chances of winning are actually, if I pick low, are actually 15 out of 18 which is below, no, 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 no. Let's see. If I, if I roll two dice, I had the wrong screen on, but you can run it. If I roll two dice, I have a value of 2 through 12. There's 36 possibilities. Six of them are sevens. 
So the chance of getting a 7 are 1 out of 6. And yet, I'm only being paid 4 to 1. So I'm getting ripped off there. If I pick low, my chances are 15 out of 36. All right. Or why can't I divide? 5 out of 12. And the odds of me winning for high or low are 5 out of 12. And I'm only getting paid 1 to 1. So my chances of winning are less than 50-50, but I only get paid as though the odds were 50-50. But this single test just makes sure that I have the mechanics of the game right. And I just have one test in there, and I should do more tests. This is a little bit difficult because of the probability involved. All right, I play uh, the game. Which rolls the dice and looks to see if I've won or not. And it gives me the payoff. Now, one thing I don't see in this is I don't see the GUI. It must have been in the next day's example. So keep this in mind, because what we're going to do Monday of next week is write a GUI for this. All right? Write a GUI where we put in high, low, or 7. And we run the game. We make our choice. And it keeps track of whether we won or lost. But I did want to introduce you to this and introduce you to the classes that we're going to be using. Because what you're going to do for your next example or for your next assignment is do something similar in that you're going to take classes that I've given you, the pizza classes, and write a GUI for it. So you're going to have a GUI that has whether it has pepperoni or not. And that could be a checkbox. The size of the pizza, that could be a drop down. And then you're going to have a button that says add the order. So when you go into this, you'll create an order object. When you click the add the order, it will create a pizza object using these parameters add it to the order, and then display the cost of the order so far. Ideally, it should do a scrolling pane to show you the list of pizzas that we ordered. We'll talk about this more in class on Monday, along with looking at the GUI for the high-low game. All right, any questions? All right, that's it for today. We'll see you up in lab.